what Catherine Russell is about, Mark. Okay, I advise you all to turn up your sound because this clip has got great sound. <laughs> is about that that's certainly a good indication this is a this is your seventh album alone together uh it was uh, jazz week's 2019 year-end chart it topped the top the charts uh so let's talk about it let's talk about firstly who are the musicians who you chose to be part of this 
um, because I'm sure that many of them are more than significant. I recognize a couple of them and uh, you probably work with them a lot. So let's hear a little bit more. Yeah, I've, uh, they've done all, they've done six out of seven, uh, most of them, you know. So what I was doing when I was first starting to record was trying to find musicians that were into swing, you know, that, that liked uh, uh, traditional jazz and swing and could also play the blues, you know. So, so these, these fellas are well-versed in uh, all styles, really all styles of music. Um, particularly the first half of the 20th century. So that is, uh, you know, and they, they swing, they are, some of them are part of Vince Giordano's Nighthawks. Um, and so have performed with, with Vince for many years. And uh, so I, I met the guitar player first and then he started to introduce me to everyone else, you know. So uh, now I've been working with, uh, many of them for the last 12, 10 to 12 years. Well, do you want to throw out some of those names uh, so sure. that we get to know who they are? Yes, on piano, Mark Shane, on bass, a uh, wonderful bass player from Israel, Tal Ronan, on drums, Mark McLean, on guitar, Matt Munisteri, on um, tenor saxophone and reeds, Evan Arnson, on uh, trumpet, John Eric Kelso, and on trombone, John Allred. Well, uh, it's a pretty uh, hardy group of uh, seasoned musicians, that much I do know. And um, I, here's something uh, that I'd like to uh, get a better idea about. Um, firstly, do you choose all of your own tunes when you're recording an album? Yes, yes. Okay. So you don't, you know, ponder with someone and, and say, well, should I sing this? Should I sing that? What do you think? It's all what you want to do. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, in the, 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 the former world be, be, before the one we're in now, um, I, when I find a tune, I learn it. You know, the tune kind of haunts me until I learn it. And then I bring it to the guys, you know, bring it to my band members we uh, try it out in front of an audience to see what the reaction to it is. And then if the reaction is favorable, I keep it in the show. And then uh, that goes on a list. I'll, I'll have a master list of tunes that I might want to record. So that's the process. So alone together um, uh, sounds like a theme. So do the rest of the tunes on this album kind of follow a path? No, uh, I, like, I like love songs and the, 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 the general theme of what I record are songs I like. That's the first, that's the first thing. And if, the, if a theme comes out of that, then that's great. But I don't go for the theme first because I don't know what I'm gonna end up with you know, I don't know what I'm going to end up wanting to record. So that's kind of for me. That's kind of putting the cart before the horse. So I have to see what the tunes are first, and then a theme may may come out of that. Yeah, that's a, that's kind of interesting because uh, when you talk to a lot of uh, singers, uh, they seem to talk about well, you know, I'm putting this show together and I'm I I have a theme, and then they kind of you know start there. So it's interesting that. And of course, I love the fact that it's tunes that you love and uh, it doesn't really matter because the tunes that you love, of course, you're going to sing your little heart out uh, <laughs> because it all settles right in your gut. So that's, that's great to hear. Uh, the, I'd, like to, I'd like to kind of move on to uh, who is Catherine Russell. I mean, we do know that you are from a family of what we call jazz royalty. Uh, your mom, Colleen Ray, not only did she play guitar and bass, but she was a great vocalist. And then your father, uh, Louis Russell, not only a pianist and an impressive band leader in New York, but uh, he was uh, Louis Armstrong's musical director. So 
you know, you grew up in a very unusual environment. And I think it would be really exciting to know that in this household of musicians, uh, did you know at the very beginning when you were just a kid, uh, I'm going to do this? Nope. No, <laughs> no. Tell us about how how you morphed into into a great musician yourself. Then I appreciate that. Um, you know, when you when you grow up with high achieving parents, it's uh, a little intimidating, and so I was not the I'm going to be in show business, you know, type of kid. I was kind of you know shy and didn't know what I wanted to do. So I started as a dancer. My mother played for dance classes at the Catherine Dunham School. And she had a friend who uh, got her into that. So she got me into that. So I was five years old and I was dancing in an African troupe, uh, African uh, ethnic dance troupe. And um, so I did that for six years. And then as you know, grew up in the New York public schools and was in choirs. And so I thought, okay, that's what I'll going to do. So, because I didn't want to really be out front. So I auditioned for the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which I ended up attending. And at the same time, I auditioned for West, Westminster Choir College, which I was also accepted to. But then when I was accepted to acting school, I said, well, you know, this might be better for me to find out who I am, you know, rather than being in a in a in a in a chorus of a hundred people, which was would have been great too. That you know, but um, I wanted to really just keep to just find out who I am, gain confidence, and just see what was going on. So um, I ended up at the academy, which was a great thing. Acting school changed my life; it was fantastic. And then after that was when I started to uh, just just build my career. You know, get gigs and learn how to record in the studio as a backup singer. And then eventually I, I got uh, the, the Broadway show, Big River. I, I went in for Jennifer Lee Warren and uh, learned about that. And then from there, you know, so one thing kind of led to the next thing. And then uh, it led to a career as a backup singer, which I still do, which is it's a great thing because I got to learn about the road and. And, and learn how to take care of myself on the road and learn how to play, you know, be on a team and work for great people. And then uh, to make a long story short, uh, you know, some years later, I was uh, touring with David Bowie, then- uh, <laughs> you're, 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 moving, you're moving so fast and so far ahead. Fast. <laughs> I, had, I had all these questions set up that I was going to ask you. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> But no, this is fabulous. But let me just backtrack for, for a minute here and just say, uh, firstly, how did you folks now feel about uh, the path that you started to uh, seem to follow on your own? And uh, you must have some fabulous stories in terms of who are the people who came to your house, uh, you know, in terms of uh, musicians, singers. I mean, you, who did you uh meet? Well, uh, my dad uh, passed away when I was seven. So okay. he had people come to the house, including Louis Armstrong, to visit him because he was ill, you know? So um, it, wasn't kind of, it wasn't really like, you know, I hear all these stories about, you know, Hollywood people, you know, Broadway people growing up and all these people like, you know, Liza Minnelli, all these people were all at the house. No, it really wasn't like that, but, um, my mother used to take me to opera parties because she was an opera buff and, uh, you know, studied classical. Uh, she was as versed in classical music as in jazz. So, um, and she was a professional choral singer. So she knew a lot of singers and they used to have these opera parties where, where you're this close to an opera singer and I'm thinking, how do they do that? You know, how do they make that incredible sound, you know, so that was kind of uh, what I was growing up doing. I was, I was going with her. She didn't, I didn't stay with babysitters. So I went with her every place. So I would go to uh, Scola Contorum uh, choral rehearsals, as well as 
Um, she took me to Leonard Bernstein Young People's Concerts. She took me also to the, to the recording studios when she was doing jazz sessions, you know. So I kind of got a, you know, an all around um, cultural upbringing, uh, you know, dance, jazz, classical, recitals, all everything, but not in my home. She, she took me to these things. Well, you had a remarkable childhood because you were exposed to so much, obviously. And then you were able to uh, decide, well, this is where I want to start my career. So um, you started to talk about, you know, yourself as a backup singer, and you were with some of the most iconic bands. You know, you were touring with Don Fagan and Steely Dan, and then you were working with David Bowie. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm going to also say you were backup, you know, with Cindy Lauper and with Michael Feinstein, and you know, it just goes on and on. So, um, of all of these experiences and these people that you worked with. Um, what stands out and who stands out the most? Uh, I would say everyone stands out for their own, you know, what I learned is that uh, all of these great artists are lifers. They're not just in it because, but, you know, fame helps, but they're in it because they're actually true creators. They're true, they're artists and they need to create, uh, they need to write songs and they need to create art. So they're not going to stop if, you know, whatever the ebbs and flows of the business are, they're, they're, they are, you know, doing their thing and, and they're giving it 200% every, every performance and every album that they make and every, you know, every show. And so that's what I got from everybody that, 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 that you mentioned is that I would watch them every night and think, well, that's how you do that. You have to get out there and leave everything there with the, with the people. You don't, you know, give them half a show, you give them everything, you know? So that was a, a great lesson, you know, for me. I mean, I went used to go and, and see Alberta Hunter, the great Alberta Hunter, uh, when, she, when she had her uh, resurgence. I used to see uh, the great, uh, Queen of the Queen of I think they were calling her uh, Bessie Smith is the Empress of the Blues and I think Ruth Brown was the Queen of R and B Queen of Rhythm and Blues and I used to go see her and uh, you know Abby Lincoln mm -hmm. and as as well as Leontine Price and you know so many fabulous uh, just artists of, of of different genres and that's what stays with me is that these these folks have to do what they do they're not they don't do it because they they need to do it because they need to do it you know so so yes. that that's the that's what stays with me all the time yeah uh did you did any of the people who you mentioned here um were they um an inspiration a specific inspiration or you felt that uh, you really wanted to learn more from uh, Alberta Hunter, let's say, because you felt that there was something inside you that was similar to one of these artists and you wanted to see whether you could develop that because, because you were watching these great people. At the time that I was uh, watching them, I wasn't conscious consciously aware that I was absorbing what they were doing. But then when I started to put my own shows together, I looked back and I said, well, how did they, then it, then it started to come to me, you know, who was going to influence the way I uh, put, put, put a song list together and put a show together and how I would learn how to be comfortable in front of an audience and, and carry a show, you know? So, um, so the, the two, the two, my two greatest influences in that regard were Alberta Hunter because she always made her audience laugh. She had a good, um, you know, she, she, she sang great blues, you know, from the twenties and she was just a great entertainer and wanted you to feel good. You know, you, you, you came out of there feeling good. And Ruth Brown was the same type of performer. You know, she'd go from a standard or a show tune to blues you know so it, her show was varied 
and she and she made you feel good. You could laugh, you know, and it was a, a more about one energy between the audience and the artist. There was no separation between I'm on the stage and you're out there, you know. So those two ladies, I would say, influenced me uh, the most for what I, you know, uh, how I wanted to put a show together. But, you know, all of those uh, artists, uh, because I, I, I kind of like, one energy in a room you know i like i like for us to have a good time together so um so you must love working in the small nightclubs and cabaret spaces where you can really uh, be in touch with the people who are watching you um what's your experience when you're when you're working a small room um i love a, i love a small room i also uh, love a larger room because it's more of a challenge to have the intimacy with people. So it really, you know, you can, it can be as intimate as a small club. If you can, if you relate to the people down front, then everybody else I find in the, in the, in the place is going to get, get it. You know, they're going to get the energy. So learning how to, how to, uh, have an intimate atmosphere in a larger room is as interesting to me as doing a smaller room. Catherine, uh, do you play any instruments? I play functionally. I'm, I'm not a like a virtuoso in anything, but I played in, in David Bowie's band. I played keyboards, percussion, uh, guitars, <laughs> and um, uh, a little bit of mandolin, you know. And in Cindy Lauper's uh, band, I played a second keyboard. She had a first keyboard player. So I was second keyboard in both of those um, it, bands, which means that I played parts. You know, I like to, I like to just play the parts and let the virtu let, let all the fancy folks, you know, play all the, play, play all the classically oriented stuff, you know, all the, all the beautiful arpeggios and all that. So I'm just holding down the, I'm holding down the, the, the parts. So, sounds like you do more. You do more than just you know dabble and play a couple of little instruments. I mean, I'm hearing, hearing a whole orchestra going on here with you. Uh, so, um, you know, you you recorded your debut album. Let's get back to your albums because in 2006, when you recorded Cat, it seems as though your career just catapulted, you know, to new heights and more albums and. You know, then you went on to all of this touring, and it, it's like your whole world opened up. So, can you talk about that? Uh, you know, when I the the album the, the cat came along uh, after um, the last David Bowie tour, and my uh, husband, who we weren't married yet at the time, but um, we'd been together a couple of years, and he said, "Well, you know." Um, there's, there's, I have a friend outside of Chicago that has a studio and he can put some musicians together. If you just give me 12 or 14 songs you want to record, I think it's time for you to make a, make, make a recording of your own. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't really want to be a band leader. I didn't want to, you know, make all the decisions and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know if I was ready to do it. He said, no, that's, that's the one thing you haven't done. So I think it's time for you to do that. So, um, we did that, which uh, then he brought a couple of record company people to hear me at a gig that I had at St. Peter's Church and uh, in Midtown Manhattan. And so, and then the next day we were sitting down negotiating uh, with one of those labels, which turned out to be uh, Harmonia Mundi, which I did um, uh, six albums, you know, with, with them. And, um, you know, I didn't know what to, what was happening really. You know, I just thought, okay, I, if we're going to do this, I want to do, you know, swing material uh, and early blues, and you know, and then uh, we'll see we'll see what happens. But I remember the the uh, the album release I did at Joe's Pub, and I was standing on stage trying to have a good time, but then thinking to myself, what did I, what did I, why did I do this? <laughs> what have I done? Oh my goodness, you know, my, my, my name is on a ticket. What did I do? You know, so then it took, it took time to just get used to that, you know, 
it doesn't have, didn't happen with me overnight, getting comfortable with what to say in between the songs and how to do this and how to do that. And all, you know, so that was a, a learning curve that I had to, uh, you know, work on for, for a few years. But the good news was that I had the support to do that. So I'm very grateful that I've had the support all these years, you know, now, uh, 14, so 15 years, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that you say, you know, what am I going to say in between a song? Uh, it's a learning curve and, and it is. So did you find that you just, you know, flew by the seat of your pants or did you eventually script it? No, I find that if I, you know, I had comedy writers tell, uh, offered to write me patter because I had worked at Catch Your Eyes and Star Comedy Club in the in the 1980s, you know, in the uh, when when comedy was was when that was the, the a big thing. So at the heyday of that movement, I had had a job singing between comics at Catch Your Eyes and Star Comedy Club, not 1986 to 1990, and got to know a bunch of those folks very very you know well. Joy Behar, Susie Essman, Colin Quinn, uh, you know Chris Rock. I mean, you name it. You know, we so because we were all up all there together. You know. And uh, so I had, uh, so Colin offered to write me patter, you know, in between songs. And I found that if I did that, I would be stiff. So I just said, let me, it, I didn't, couldn't find a way, even with my acting training to make that natural for myself. I just had to go with how I feel at the moment, reacting to the audience, um, to what's happening in the room, you know? So, um, so it was just from doing it a lot just doing it and doing it and doing it. Then I said, said okay, eventually I can tell them who the, who the composer and lyricist is for this tune. I can tell them, give them a little, um, you know, history on this tune or that tune or why I picked it or something like that. And then keep it short, short enough in between songs. And then, then I found eventually that people actually appreciated um, knowing that, you know, people appreciated the information. Yeah, that, that's similar to when I uh, listened to Michael Feinstein. And, yeah. uh, you know, he's so good with uh, the history of uh, the songwriters and, uh, and a tune and when it was uh, first written. And, you know, that, that's just the greatest information that you can possibly offer to an audience. And I think because it's in the moment, it, it just comes across so easily and so naturally. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that, that's wonderful. I, I'd like to also talk about your, uh, your Grammy. I mean, not, I know you've had more than one, but in 2012, you were a uh, featured artist for the best compilation soundtrack uh, for HBO's Boardwalk Empire, singing Crazy Blues, a 1920s tune. So, um, can you tell us about that experience? Because, wow, I mean, did you get to hobnob with the cast? And, uh, you know, what was the whole thing like? No, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's funny because uh, <laughs> you, you learn about the difference between um, reality and what things look like. So that session came through Vince Giordano. Huh? And I had been working with Vince. And he said, he called me up, you know, one day and say, hey, it's Vince. I got a little tune for you. I got a session that I want you to do. And um, so, you know, here's the tune. I didn't know anything about the crazy blues. I learned the history about it afterwards, Mamie Smith and all of that uh, history. And, um, and then, so it started out as just a recording session. And he said, are you available? Wednesday at two or whenever it was. So I said, sure, went in and recorded the song with Mark Shane, who is the, my regular uh, piano player. And Boardwalk Empire wasn't a show at that point. They were just recording uh, music. You know, they said, let's record uh, period music for this upcoming show. And they didn't know it was going to be a hit. They didn't know anything like that. So at the point when I recorded it, we were just two of us in the studio, three of us, me, Vince, and Mark. Uh, and, and that was that, you know? And yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> so so I, I, was, I was never on the set, 
or, or I anything. Went, you know. I went on to interpret this as as though, oh, there she was hobnobbing with this one and that one, and <laughs> I thought we get some inside scoop here, but I guess no. not. So. <laughs> no, you know, and and I've also had the experience, and I'm not, I can't remember if 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 this if this was the uh, instance, but uh, I think it might have been. Uh, I did a four tunes for a movie called Kill Your Darlings. And um, it was about uh, uh, Jack Kerouac and, you know, uh, Allen Ginsberg and, 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 uh, and did the movie did fairly well, independent film. And so uh, I uh, did the sound and this, this is also what's happened, what happens. And then they had a, uh, an another black woman lip sync to me for one tune for a scene and because she was lighter skinned and they, they wanted a Billie Holiday-esque looking black woman. Huh. So, 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 you know, she's in the scene, but it's me singing the tune. <laughs> so <laughs> this happens too, you know. <laughs> That's an interesting no way. bit of, uh, of information. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> You know, you you have uh, you you have what is known as impeccable phrasing, and you have that that lovely vocal clarity, and you know that uh, dexterity. Your voice kind of like can you know swoop here and swoop there, and it all seems so effortless. Um, and, and many many people you know really sit up and take notice because of that, um, but. You know, well, you, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I, I, I thank you. I really appreciate it. It, it, it you know, it's just, um, it's just the way it is. And uh, I think people watching that video got it, um, which uh, they should have. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> I, got, I have chewed up another video if you'd like it. Oh. Short, we could do a piece of a short one. Oh, well, why not? So More, well, Catherine Russell. All right, let me uh, share that one. Hold on a second. Uh, I won't play the whole thing because it might be kind of long. Every time we have a date, but I love him. Yes, I love him. I'm gonna go around to his gate, see if I can get a few things straight, cause I want him. question coming right out of that for you, Catherine. First of all, your, your band just has a wonderful sound, but um, 
How does it feel when you're watching yourself in, a, in one of these moments? I know when I look at myself, I get very critical. What, what do you think of when you're looking at something like one of these clips? You know, it's, uh, I wish, uh, I just say, oh, well, that's the way I look. <laughs> Gotta accept it. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> so, you know, because the, the, the studio is the only place where I close my eyes uh, when I'm singing. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't have to get dressed up. I don't have to wear makeup. It's kind of like, I'm not, I'm going to just be in my, in my world, you know, it, at, at that moment. So uh, the camera's on and that's, 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 I got to live with it, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> but, uh, but I love to record though, so. Yeah, uh, that's, that's obvious. And, and you know something, I just have to say that uh, NPR, when they wrote about you, they said, a voice that wails like a horn and whispers like a snake in the Garden of Eden. Would you say that's accurate? <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, you know, I just, I'm just reacting, you know, I also work with um, great arrangers, you know, Mark Lopeman, um, Reed Mann, also uh, one of Vince Giordano's Nighthawks does a lot of my arranging. And so I'm able to just kind of wear his arrangements like a, like a blanket, you know, like I can just get inside of the arrangements and react to what the musicians are playing, you know? So that's, for me, that's very inspiring. So uh, I know, I, I think I already know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. If you had one favorite song to choose, what would it be? Hmm, one favorite song that I've sung or one favorite song that I would want to sing or? I mean, I mean, there are songs that, you know, uh, uh, I got to sing, uh, that's a hard question. I don't know if I can answer that, but I, I got to sing another opening, another show uh, uh, last year with the, with the Philly Pops, which was a great, that, I, I just had a ball doing that, you know. And, um, you know, another rope day, another. I just, I just loved it. It was great. And, you know, with a symphony and it was a big place and, you know, it was, it was just a lot of fun, you know. And um, so there, there, there are things that, uh, I mean, I don't know. There, there are songs that, you know, I wish, like, I, I was... Liza Minnelli and, and Michael Feinstein are, are very close, you know, so Liza would come to a lot of shows of his when we were working um, at Feinstein's at the Regency years ago. And she got up and, and I had seen the act, you know, I had gone to see her so many years ago. And, um, and she got up on stage and I was this close to her because I was the girl in the, on the inside. So we had three, three, three backup singers and I was on the inside. So she, they, they sang, you know, I love a violin, I love it. And the way she sang that, she, you know, I just said, I want that. That's what, that's what I want. I want to just, I want my whole being to be in the, in the tune when I, when, I, when it's, so when she, finished doing that she had a, she lost an earring during the tune and she was just you know I mean just so it that's not an answer to the question you asked me but but it's more the conviction it's more the the passion of the artist that comes out for yeah. me it sounds know? like it sounds like uh <laughs> you, you somewhere want to be a big Broadway star <laughs> and maybe well, and maybe that should be part of what you think about doing because just hearing the description of what that felt like, you know, singing, singing that song and, and uh, you know, listening to Liza and, and getting an infusion from her is like a whole other path that you may decide to take. Well, I, as uh, I did River on Broadway and I had for six months, for the last six months to the run and I had, uh, I was in and out. And I had one song, and uh, I, I think that now, if I were given the, the opportunity again, 
I would be so much more comfortable than I was in 1987 when I realized that um, it was my opening night and I had uh, just walked around and gotten, my, got, gotten the blocking from the director. So what people sometimes don't know is if you're not in the original cast, you're, you're not rehearsing with the cast. You're just walking and getting your blocking and going from place to place. And then your opening night is when you find out why. <laughs> why am I walking over here now? Oh, because 50 people are coming behind me. That's why, you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I would hope that, uh, you know, I've had other, uh, I've actually passed auditions for two other off-Broadway shows that I ended up not being able to do because of my tour schedule. And so if this uh, opportunity were to come up again, I would hope that I would be in the original cast of something. So mm. I would get the benefit of workshopping it and, 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 and doing that, you know? So uh, who, who knows? <laughs> who knows is right. Is right. So, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're not performing or uh, in a recording studio, do you have any hobbies or anything that you really feel passionate about doing? Since uh, if for the last seven months, I found out what if, if I have hobbies because we've been home for, for seven months, which, uh, you know, I hadn't been home like this since I was maybe since I was in my late 20s or something. I mean, it's been a long time, you know, and I realized that uh, I hadn't really been home with my husband for seven months and we've been together 20 years. And so, you know, so. Uh, we have a house full of books and mostly biographies. So I love reading biographies uh, to, be, to learn about people and, um, and history, you know. And, uh, and I also uh, do my New York Times uh, mini crossword puzzle every day. And I do my New York Times spelling bee. I like word, word games and word puzzles because they, they, they keep me learning and thinking. So, um, I, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, other things that I like to do, but so far I like that. That's what, that's what I look forward to doing besides, uh, watching, uh, Perry Mason reruns, uh, at, oh. at, at, <laughs> and Turner Classic Movies. Oh yeah. I'm big on Turner Classic Movies myself. <laughs> um, uh, aren't you giving master classes? I am. I am. I'm doing, I'm doing more teaching and, um, and also, yeah, I forgot the U S open. Oh, the U S open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I taught for, you know, since the, since the late nineties, I taught at Berkeley college of music and, and had students all throughout, you know? Um, so I have, uh, one student that I've been mentoring and teaching now for three years she's 19 she's fabulous so she's now at the new school and then i uh taught, uh, I, i've done a few actually in these last uh, few months different panels and uh, master classes and uh, i'm about to probably about to join uh alexis cole who's a one of our uh, wonderful jazz singers started a website called jazzvoice.com where she uh, hosts uh, many singers and um, gathers people from all over the world actually to take their classes. So I did a class through her and then I had some inquiry, inquiries through that to see if I teach. So I will be uh, adding uh, students uh, from that. Yeah, as you should, uh, you know, uh, your talents should not go to waste. They should be passed along. <laughs> And now is now is the time to uh, to do that because you can you can get students from all over the world at this yes. center, you know to uh, work with you uh, on on a Zoom platform uh, or one of its uh, lookalikes. I'm not sure about those yet, but um, yeah, I, I you know I was hoping that you know you would say that that's part of what you're doing, um, but. You've got some other things coming up. I know I, I did look up the, 
well, I know your books, uh, whether these things are going to happen, but I think there are some festivals, uh, uh, Vail and Telluride and uh, the, New the Newport Jazz Festival. So what do we think about that? Are well, they all of, yeah, all of, I'm sorry if I didn't interrupt you. All of these things, everything that was going to happen in, this year, in 2020, has been moved to 2021. So if all of those things happen, I'll be very busy in 2021. So it be, will be my first Newport Jazz Festival and my second <clears throat> Chicago Blues Festival. And uh, I've been working with the great John Pizzarelli for you know three plus years. So we have a bunch of uh, gigs coming up and the, uh, what, the theme of that, one of them is Billy and Blue Eyes, which is uh, Billy Holiday and Frank Sinatra. So we do a themed show of that and then we have another one that we're working on which is he had just put out a an album of of the songs of nat king cole so we do um uh nat king cole and then i'll pick from the great ladies of uh of, of song and so we have kind of two shows that we're that we're doing so that will resume if you know possible we hope uh in the in january and then I also have uh, uh, a show that we developed at uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center with myself uh, and Brianna Thomas and Sharnay Wade, who are two uh, younger singers in New York City. And we do uh, swing and blues. You know, we do a lake it's called Lady Sing the Blues. Mm -hmm. So we do a, a, a show of comic uh, tunes, you know, and swing tunes and um, from the 20s and 30s mostly, you know, and yeah. Betty Smith, Fats Waller, uh, so forth. So isn't it great knowing that there are young people out there that are so enthralled with that era of music that they want to keep it alive? Yes, and all and that's that's all over the world, you know, so so people uh, have contacted us for lyrics, they've contacted us, oh, do you have a chart for this or that? Some, some of them have no charts, you know, they don't have musical uh, charts. So uh, I, you know, have written the charts myself or whatever, you know, but um, yeah, so we have young people, uh, uh, you know, contacting us. We have swing dancers from all over the world that have, that have danced, made videos to, the, to some of the songs that I've recorded, which is really fun. So. My husband finds those things, you know, they post them on YouTube and, you know, so it's, 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 it's fun. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. Uh, Mark, uh, do we have any questions? We do, we have a few. First, uh, from Sarah Ann asks, uh, do you write any of your own material? I have written, uh, uh, let's see, I wrote one, which is on my second album and I co-wrote one which I think is on my first album. When I uh, write, I don't pick the genre. I'm just happy for the whatever the, the muse is that comes to me. And generally it's not in a jazz idiom. So um, it wouldn't fit within the material that I record mostly. And I feel like there are so many well-written songs that don't get done enough. So I, I you know, like to pay homage to good songwriting <laughs> rather than just put something on an album just because I wrote it. I don't think that's a good enough reason. Uh, Judy Stewart asks, how does your terrific ability to dance affect your choice of music? <laughs> Judy, you're, you're very fun. Um, <laughs> and thank you, Judy. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I love to move to music. I love music that makes me physically move. So uh, that's why I like swing, you know. And I also uh, love playing for dancers, you know. So when the band, when we've done swing dances, we've done two Midsummer Night Swing dances in the, in the, in the, uh, at Lincoln Center, and actually more than that. And um, uh, I did uh, one with some more Orleans, a great, last year at Lincoln at Jazz at Lincoln Center, which is a tribute to, to the great Danny Barker. Um, great, too. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, and, and um, so 
I don't know. I, I, I stopped dancing professionally many years ago, but I, I just like to move. So you move. She moves. <laughs> I, I have a question. I have a question here from uh, Errol Rappaport, uh, who first says she's wonderful in today's climate. What advice would Catherine give to a person starting out in the music world? What? Okay, I lost the end of your question because I probably haven't. Okay. Now, um, the question oh, yeah. is: Yes. What advice would you give? to a person starting out in the music world? What advice? Yes. Uh, well, you know, the way uh, that I and most of my colleagues start out is by singing any place you can, learning as many songs as you can, and meeting musicians who are aligned with the kind of music that you want to perform and want to, want to do, want to record. And, and creating your network from there. So we don't do this in a vacuum. So it's very important that we meet people and, and create the network of people that, that, that we can help each other to do the kind of music and performance that we want to do. And it takes time. So, you know, we can't expect anything to happen overnight. These things take five years, 10 years, you know, to develop a, a, a very solid network of, of, of people. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Ann Rogers asks, uh, did you sing in the New York City All City Chorus with John Motley? No, I did not. I missed out on that and I wish I had. I did not, they were, uh, I think, at, or did, I went to music and art high school and I think they were before that, they were having auditions, you know, for all city high school chorus. And I always wanted to do that with Mr. Motley and I, I never got to do that. Magda, why don't you jump in? I want to ask you about um, your voice. Uh, it's your instrument. How do you take care of it? Do you vocalize? What is your method of keeping your voice, especially now? I don't know if you're singing as much as you do when you work. How would you keep it in shape? It's a muscle. Yeah, it's challenging because I'm used to, I was used to singing every day, basically every other day. And so I have exercises. I have two teachers and I have um, exercises that uh, I do. Sometimes I'll do 20 minutes. Sometimes I'll do 10 minutes. If I'm working on a particular part of my voice, I'll pinpoint that part and work on that for another 10. And uh, some days I take the day off. So I would say um, I'll do exercises every two to two or three. If I'm leading up to a gig or, you know, what, what I've been doing actually are recording uh, sessions in, the, in my home to send to people, you know, when they ask me, oh, Put, can you put some background vocals on this? So I'll record them here and send them uh, over Dropbox or whatever, you know. Um, so if it's leading up to something, I'll vocalize every day for three or four days or something leading up to that, to that gig, you know. So if you, if you do that, then a good 15, 20 minutes twice a day is is good you don't want to weigh yourself out so if you so my one of my teachers suggests you know take breaks so i have a i have a series of exercises that i do that take you know 20 minutes so uh if i'm singing at night say i'll do those twice twice in that day and then i also warm down after the after what i'm doing interesting I've got one question from Leslie Middlebrook. Uh, with your wide background in music, did you ever consider studying as an opera singer? Your voice certainly would have been lovely. How did you make your choice to go into jazz instead of classical? And were there more opportunities in jazz and Broadway for you? Uh, yeah, cl the classical field is, is, is very difficult. And um, it's, you know, what roles are you going to pursue? 
um, there weren't, you know, as many opportunities for, for black women. Um, you know, we have our stars, we have our Leontines and, 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 and so forth, our Grace Mumbries and, 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 the, and that, but, you know, what roles are you going to do? So Aida, basically, you know, and um, uh, so, so it, and, it, and it just uh, made more sense to me because I wanted to make a living uh, as, a, as a vocalist. So how was I going to do that? <laughs> you know? And so that's what I was really concerned with. So I grew up, uh, you know, with classical training, singing in choirs and so forth. My mother was a, a classical contralto. And, um, but she did recitals, you know, she didn't do roles uh, in, in opera. And so I just thought, boy, well, all of the time it's gonna take me to be as good as I want to be as an opera singer, I should pursue something that will make me a living, you know, and give me opportunities quicker. And I know that sounds, I don't know how it sounds, but um, it had, it's, you know, it wasn't any faster because I'm not a young person anymore, but um, it just seemed to, the way the path led me just seemed to lead me to, to this as opposed to opera. But I am a, such a great lover of opera. I have so much respect for it. I love to listen to it. It, it just brings tears to my eyes because I can't believe what those people are do. I can't believe it. So I, I really have the utmost respect for it and I will always love it. Back to you, Sandy. Okay, well, um... We don't have any more questions. And Catherine, um, is there anything that you would like to say to the lambs uh, that you feel would be important for them to hear? Well, first of all, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I was going to say yes. Thank you so much for, for having me as a guest. I really appreciate that. I look forward, yes, I look forward to seeing everyone, really seeing you, uh, for real, hopefully, uh, as soon as we can next year, I hope, uh, maybe sooner, I hope. And um, I would just say uh, thank you for, for everything, Mark, that, that, that you're doing. Um, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Magda. And anything that uh, you want to do in life, I have I have um, met singers in middle age who are uh, they've come to me and they've said, "Is it too late?" It's never too late. So that's what I would say. If you want to do something, and uh, particularly from my perspective as a vocalist, do it. Just just do it because if it brings you joy, then that's we need more joy. <laughs> we need more joy in the world. So if you're doing something that makes you happy, and that brings you joy and brings joy to other people, then let, let's, let's, let's keep doing that. Let's, let's uh, you know, joy and peace and, and love and all that corny stuff is, um, you know, how we, how we heal each other. And, and a little rhythm and, helps. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's such a joy to speak with you tonight. And um, boy, just keep doing what you're doing. I, <laughs> I, uh, I hope that we come in contact very soon. I hope actually that I will be at uh, one of your next concerts uh, and see you live and in person up on stage. Thank you very much. I, I, I look, I'm looking forward to that myself. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of the Lambs, Catherine, thanks so much for doing this this evening and sharing and sharing your evening with us. Uh, for those of you who got your emails, if you wish to make a small donation to keep the Lambs healthy and alive, that is most welcome. Uh, I want to thank uh, our our interviewer Sandy Durrell for jumping in last minute and coming up with all these questions and really being a good. great interviewer. Thank you. Pleasure. And a thank you to Magda Katz for arranging us. And Magda, you want to announce uh, what we have coming up? Oops. You're on mute, Magda. 
Unmute. <laughs> okay. First, I want to go. thank Catherine, and I can't wait to see you in person. Yes. Uh, I, I'm such a fan. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being with us. Uh, and thank you, Mark, and thank you, Sandy. This was an incredible evening. Um, next up will be the 14th. We're going to have Amanda Vale, who's going to be, who's an author who wrote a book about Jerome Robbins. And then on the 30th, we have James Barber, the Broadway performer. And then the next night, we have back to back Julian Mills, you know, Haley Mills' sister. And, you know, she's an incredible actress. And I just found out we're going to have Jeffrey Jones on, I believe, October 13th. You know, the actor who was in uh, Ferris Bueller. He, yeah, you'll recognize him. He's been a lot of things. And I hope, uh, you know, we get together and everybody comes to Catherine's next show. We'll all be there. <laughs> oh, we will. We'll do a Lambs come. Night Out. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Catherine, you have to come to the Lambs. Yes. To the Lambs. Yes. I'm looking forward to it. OK, <laughs> take care. Thank you. Keep safe. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>